Okay, it's a real pleasure that I've been invited to come and share one of my great passions with you, uh, comparative magnetospheres. I'll explain what magnetospheres are shortly. Um, but really what this talk is all about is uh, Earth's aurora and Jupiter's aurora, and I'm assuming that everybody in this audience, being from Fairbanks, knows what the aurora is. That's one of the great pleasures that I have, that we have for giving auroral seminars in Fairbanks. Is I've got an entire audience that knows basically what I'm talking about. Uh, I've given a similar talk in Colorado, and I always have to give a primer on the aurora. People have heard of the aurora, but it's uh, a little bit fuzzy as to what exactly it is. But I'm glad that I have a, a synchronized audience, audience on this topic. Okay, so as was mentioned, I'm a professor of space physics, joint appointment with the UAF Physics Department and the Geophysical Institute. Um, my specialty, one of my specialties, is the numerical simulation of what, what we call space plasmas. Uh, and it's computer simulations, we solve mathematical equations, we try and make predictions, and we compare with data. Most of the data that, that I look at is from NASA missions, flagship missions to Jupiter and Saturn, and also to Pluto. And I'm not going to talk about Pluto, but I, th I threw this image on just for fun. This is a, a computer simulation of the solar wind interaction with Pluto's escaping atmosphere. We just produced this image over the weekend. I was very excited about it because it's fun to look at. It's unlike anything uh, that you would find elsewhere in the solar system. Um, that's all I'm going to say about Pluto, but I also want to just say that this is a great simulation that was done by one of our UAF graduate students, Nathan Barnes. Okay, so let's get back to the topic um, of interest tonight, and that is the aurora. Really, I hope I don't have to spend too much time on these slides, but I threw a collection of slides together of Earth, Earth's aurora, the terrestrial aurora. But let me just point out a few basic features that most of you are familiar with. So you know the colors, you know the green curtains. What you probably don't see that often are these deeper red colors that are at much higher altitude. Cameras are very sensitive to this red, and, and generally your, your camera will pick that up, but your eye won't. But in many cases, these thin curtains, green curtains, extend to very high altitudes. And I'll talk a little bit about what causes those, those colors in a, a little bit. So here's another example of thin, tall curtains. Um, as you know, they're very dynamic. I don't have to play a movie for you to know that. You know that these are dynamic structures. They're fun to watch. These thin curtains are the ones that I find particularly interesting. Here's another example of, of a deeper red emission. Um, one of the great things about Fairbanks is we can look straight up and see the aurora. If you're from Minnesota, perhaps you're looking at the aurora on the horizon and it's just this distant green glow. But in Fairbanks, we get to look straight up. And so when you do look straight up, a lot, a lot of times these structures seem to be converging and they're tracing the Earth's magnetic field lines basically. So it's like looking at railroad tracks which converge together in the distance. Uh, and again, these green emissions tend to be lower altitude, these red emissions at higher altitude. Sometimes some of the best auroral um, auroras that I've ever seen are, involve clouds. In fact, one of the most exciting events was on a completely overcast night in Fairbanks, and it was like lightning behind the clouds. It was unbelievable. I knew what was happening back there behind the clouds, but um, it really made for some spectacular effects. When you look at this image, you might question, well, is the aurora in front of the cloud or behind the cloud? So if, if, you, if you don't have spacecraft information or space-based data, that, that image may be ambiguous. Uh, something fun to think about. More thin curtains, red at high altitude, looping structures, horseshoe structures, uh, really a myriad of things. Sometimes the aurora takes on more uh, diffuse, uh, broader scale arcs, but, um, <clears throat> and sometimes you know, after these events take place, the whole sky can fill with auroral emissions and pulsate in sort of diffuse patches, so some of you may, may be familiar with that aspect of the aurora too. Okay, so studies of the aurora goes all the way back into ancient legends. You can uh, talk to Eskimo, Athabascan Indians, Laps, Greenlanders, <clears throat> and even Northwest Indian tribes, and all will have uh, an interpretation. 
Uh, some of those include path, torch-lit pathways to heaven. They may involve fearful omens, warnings from heaven, fire in the air, <clears throat> um, heavenly battles, you name it. There's a, a tremendous rich history if you go back and look um, at our understandings of the aurora. Um, but there are many mysteries. You know, why the colors? Why do we only see them at high latitudes? Now, what altitude does the, does the aurora occur? Uh, these, are, these are some of the mysteries that we need to understand. Um, in dealing with my own kids, it was easy to motivate studying the aurora because I had Disney <laughs> uh, to help me out. Some of you may have seen the movie Brother Bear. My kids just happened to have been at the right age when this movie came out. Uh, and the aurora is prominently featured in that. Um, something else that you'll see in that movie is, in fact, the ancestral, um, sort of the destiny for ancestors. Uh, um, and so that was another discussion that came up that you'll find um, as a common interpretation of the aurora. So one of the greatest breakthroughs in my mind in understanding the aurora is to actually see the aurora from space. Once you can see it from space, then the whole thing has context. You have global context. Um, our very own Shunaka Sofu, who is former director of the Geophysical Institute, uh, <laughs> made some groundbreaking discoveries about the aurora by setting up multiple cameras throughout the Arctic region and then looking at the global scale of what was happening. And, and from that, we, we sort of first began to understand the sequence of events that you see every night in the aurora. And that's called the substorm process. But when you actually get into space, now you have this global context and you can see the auroral emissions organized very neatly into what we call an auroral oval, uh, both in the north and the south, right? So this was from um, the Dyna Dynamics Explorer satellite, these images. <clears throat> uh, this <laughs> animation, if I can get it to play, is not from a spacecraft. But you can imagine if a spacecraft flew to Jupiter, this is what you might see. The image of Jupiter's aurora here is in fact a real image taken from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, but you can see as well that there's sort of an oval of emissions that's centered in the northern region. Uh, what's not shown in this animation would be an equivalent southern region too. So, so that was just a quick uh, overview of, of the two planets and their aurora. So what we want to do is try and dig a little bit deeper to understand what the origin of these auroral emissions is. And so to understand the origin, we have to take a step back, a huge step back and go all the way to the sun. So when we study the field, uh, study space physics, as I call it, or space plasma physics, it's, it's a field that has tremendous breadth. Uh, perhaps a better term for it would be heliophysics. So in order to understand auroral physics, we really have to understand the source of the energy input or our, so our solar wind or the winds that emanate from the sun itself. So most are perhaps familiar. This is a, uh, uh, a picture of the sun in visible light. It's called the photosphere. And you'll notice that there's a dark spot there. So this is a sunspot. It's particularly useful to look at the sun in different wavelengths. So that was the visible. If you look at it in the UV, this is 1600 angstrom. Now you can see additional structures. There's that sunspot again, but now there's this patchy uh, network of, of emissions. Here's a, an even shorter wavelength. So now we're looking at what's called the chromosphere of the sun. Again, that sunspot is now buried somewhere in here, but there's a lot of other uh, features starting to take form here. There's bright spots and dark spots everywhere. But notice that where that sunspot is, there really is a, tr a considerable amount of activity here and whatever this is. And if I go even to shorter wavelength, now you can start to see some really interesting uh, structures coming off of the limb of the sun here. And in fact, what you're seeing here are emissions which are essentially illuminating the solar magnetic field, which is a very, very complex structure. Has anybody seen solar eclipse? In totality, in totality, okay? So we all know this. This is one of the most spectacular things I think that you can 
other than seeing the aurora, cl clearly the aurora is very interesting, but if you can go and see a solar eclipse in totality, it brings the sun to life. Uh, I took my daughter to Jackson, Wyoming for the last eclipse that was at two years ago, 2017, <laughs> losing track of time. And she dragged her heels a little bit and we had to go on this long car ride and wasn't too certain. And, but her reaction when that went into, to into totality was priceless. It was absolutely priceless. She was embarrassed when I played the video back. <laughs> <laughs> her reactions were just, she was over the moon with excitement. Uh, so, there's an eclipse coming up in Alaska in, does anybody know, 20, 25, 30, 35? I've forgotten what it is. I, that's a long time from now, but anyway, if anybody is in the mood for a total, and I, I think, believe that's totality and somewhere near Nome, I, I forgot. But look out, see if you, it's worth traveling for. It's absolutely worth traveling for. My parents went all the way to uh, Australia for an eclipse. The totality was when the sun was near the horizon. It was not optimal, but they said it was the most spectacular eclipse they've seen because of the sunset coloring as well. It was truly spectacular. So look out for them. I, I highly recommend it. It brings the sun to life, it brings all of the structure to life. So the sun is, is actually an, ab an absolutely fascinating um, object in the field of, of heliophysics. So for those of you who know what I mean by magnetic field lines, this is what the sun looks like with tracings of its magnetic field. And you can see the absolutely complex structures that, that form. Remember that sunspot is located here. So that's a, a dark spot. And so where it's dark, there are also some light spots. So field lines, magnetic field lines seem to emanate from that sunspot. So that's actually a very interesting property of the sunspot itself. So now let's put this thing to life. This is a sequence of images taken from the, sorry, you can't read the caption. We were struggling with the formatting on this, but this is the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Um, it's looking in multiple wavelengths at the sun. You can go to the website for the Solar Dynamics Observatory and see current images of the sun in whatever wavelengths you'd like. Let me see if we can get that to go again. It's dynamic. Uh, you can see these magnetic structures sort of wiggling around. Um, this is obviously in a very short wavelength. Okay, so for the solar eclipse folks, this is sort of what you might have seen. Well, maybe not these coronal mass ejections, which are illustrated here. Sorry, that, oh, there it goes again. This is the sun's diameter here. So we're, we're screening out most of the light here, now really looking at the more extended structures from the sun. So think of the sun really as this gas ball, which is blowing out a gas supersonically. So that gas is ionized, it's protons. We call it plasma, so ionized gas being a plasma, and it's blowing out at a supersonic speed and into the heliosphere. Okay, so when I say solar wind, that's what I'm referring to. You think of this as sort of an illustration of what that solar wind might look like. So the solar wind blows out until it encounters an obstacle like Earth. So you know what Earth basically is. It's got uh, some solid inner core here and a liquid outer core and something happens. You end up with some vigorous motions of these electrically conducting iron fluids, if you will. And that generates, through a dynamo process, a magnetic field. So the Earth has a magnetic field. You can think of it like a little um, bar magnet as a North Pole, South Pole. And so those are the magnetic field lines. Um, here's another illustration of the Earth's magnetic field. This magnetic field is now an obstacle to the flow of the solar wind. Okay. And now we're finally getting to that nasty word in the introduction, <laughs> the magnetosphere. So when the solar wind interacts with the planetary magnetic field, it generates a cavity in the solar wind called a magnetosphere. So this is an illustration of what the Earth's magnetosphere might look like. Here's some, some satellites flying around making measurements, but you can see the magnetic field structures. Uh, so the sun is over here, the solar wind is blowing towards the Earth, and all of these magnetic field lines tend to get swept back like a windsock. And so that cavity that's formed in the, in the uh, 
interplanetary space is called the magnetosphere. It is somewhat isolated uh, from the solar wind itself, so most of the solar wind is deflected and goes around, but there is an interaction between that solar wind and this cavity. And it's that interaction through a complex chain of events that produces our aurora. Okay, so here's another summary. Start with the sun, it's solar wind, and it produces a magnetosphere. Remember, it's a supersonic flow, so we actually end up with a bow shock in front of the obstacle as well, um, which is another interesting property of these magnetospheres, is this bow shock. So it's supersonic until it goes through the shock, and then it becomes a subsonic flow. It's accelerated around the obstacle and then back to supersonic speeds again. So this is why I felt that using my computer was important because I wanted you to see this NASA animation. So this is just for fun, really. It gives you sort of a visual representation of the solar wind. So there's the sun with its sunspots blowing out this gas. The gas interacts with the planet's magnetosphere, these magnetic field lines. A complex sequence of events take place that involve the opening of magnetic field lines and ultimately the closing of magnetic field lines back here. And this generates, a, again, it's a complex sequence of, of events. It produces waves, and eventually those waves accelerate electrons to very high speeds. Those electrons then bombard the Earth's atmosphere, and voila, there is the aurora. Okay, this is not the direct entry of solar wind material striking the atmosphere. It's a process by which material or plasma that's already in the magnetosphere is accelerated to very, very high energy, and at that point it, it can uh, produce the auroral emissions. So Earth's magnetosphere is fun, it's interesting. Let me tell you about a real magnetosphere now. <laughs> this is just a schematic of Jupiter's magnetic field. Jupiter has a very strong magnetic field. Uh, just to illustrate very crudely, the scale of Jupiter's magnetosphere is, here's Earth's magnetosphere here, and that fits in this little black box right here in Jupiter's magnetosphere. So this diminutive magnetosphere that we live in is tiny in comparison to, to this beast. So um, just keep that in mind when we get back to Jupiter. Both of them have magnetospheres, but ultimately what I'm going to tell you is the process by which the aurora is generated is fundamentally different between these two planets. Okay, so where can you see the aurora? Uh, again, apologize for the aspect. We're clipping all of these slides a bit. So let's find Alaska. Here it is, the pink dot right there. So this is when we are at noon. So at noon, generally, this is the statistical average location of the auroral emissions. So at noon, we're sort of south of the, the average. We're not going to see it on the day side anyway in Alaska, especially in the summer. Uh, so here we are. Here's Alaska at dusk. So early evening, Alaska starts to creep into that auroral oval. So if you're watching for the aurora early evening, what you're going to see is auroral emissions north of us. And as the night wears on here at midnight, we end up right under the middle, right in the middle of this auroral oval. And then here we are at dawn, kind of creeping back out. So the general sequence of events is you start early evening, you see the aurora to the north, it slowly moves overhead, maybe something really exciting happens, <laughs> a substorm, and then it'll retreat back to the north again. So that's on average where you might see the aurora, but that doesn't mean you won't see the aurora in other places. So Here's the probability of seeing the aurora in North America. Um, so in Fairbanks, we see the aurora 100 nights per year. Seattle might see it 10 nights per year. San Francisco, one night per year. And Mexico City, one night in 10 years. Okay. So obviously, we're ideally situated. So this auroral oval can expand, depending on what the driving conditions are of the solar wind. Uh, but typically, that's, that's not the case. And, but eventually, you know, so even when I lived in Boulder, Colorado, we did see the aurora. Somebody called me up and said, the aurora is going to be out tonight. And I said, oh, really? 
Do I care? <laughs> um, typically, when the aurora expands that far south, it's that deep red emission that's hard for the naked eye to see. That's why I wasn't that excited about the aurora coming to Boulder, Colorado. How high is the aurora? This is a quick schematic just to illustrate. So here's the height of a commercial airliner at 10 kilometers. The lower edge of these arcs is about 80 to 100 kilometers. And then, oh shoot, the scale, I'm gonna have to go, okay, oh, this is miles, that's fine. So these red emissions that generally you're not gonna see maybe 150 to 200 kilometers in altitude and higher, okay? But this is where you typically see these emissions, these bright emissions are in the 80 to 100 kilometer range. Quick tutorial on what causes, causes the colors. Again, I'm not a chemist. I don't know this stuff very well, I'm embarrassed to say. But it starts with energetic electrons streaming down the magnetic field lines. Those electrons then impact our neutral atmosphere. So it turns out that oxygen, the oxygen atom, um, has a, a transition that involves this red glow but it is a long-lived transition. So anybody who knows about uh, atomic transitions, you know, you, if you don't understand or haven't heard this stuff, just ignore me, but this is a, a metastable state, so it's very long-lived. So the reason you can see it at high altitude is it essentially tends to be collisionless, but if you put this atom into a denser atmosphere where there are frequent collisions, you basically destabilize that so it can never really emit. So that's, that's why you tend to see this red at high altitude because it requires that collisionless state to see. Uh, nitrogen produces this blue when it's impacted by, um, by an electron and then secondary electrons give rise to the green color that we most typically see and that's uh, again from oxygen. So remember the atmosphere contains oxygen and nitrogen the green is what we typically see. When you have a very energetic electron coming down, you can see sometimes the red lower borders or the pink lower borders of the aurora. That's a nitrogen molecule emission that tends to give you that crimson color. So typically, this is the part that we see with our naked eye. Look for that, though. OK, uh, let's see if this animation runs. We'll take our time with this. So this is an all-sky video um, that was taken from Poker Flat. Uh, you'll start to see it. The room's a little bit bright, but I think we'll be okay once the aurora becomes bright. Can everybody see these emissions down here? Okay, so what we're doing, if this is an all-sky camera, so the way that you visualize this is stand with your back south facing north and look straight up. So in the all-sky, north is down, south is up. So this is early in the evening, local time is around nine o'clock here, and we're seeing the progression of these auroral emissions steadily working their way south and almost overhead at this point. Uh, local time is coming up to 10. Now you can see there's emissions that have gone south of Fairbanks or south of Poker Flat, okay? Lost track of local time here because we can't read it there. 10.30. You see there's some interesting wave structures that take place. You can see these flickers or pulsations. Again, aurora at this level of intensity isn't something that's going to dazzle you. You're not going to go out and say, wow, look at the aurora. This is a, this is a little more subtle. Okay? But the good news is if you're trying to see the brilliant substorms that everybody really wants to see, is this has expanded considerably in that the equator most arc here is south of Fairbanks. That's probably a good sign. So if you're paying attention and you were planning on, st on staying up for the night to watch the aurora, this is a pretty good setup for you. So we must be getting to local time, roughly midnight here. Yep, midnight. Uh, again, a little bit more southward expansion. Watch this thing. This is a good sign. Watch this thing, if, see if it starts to structure. If it begins to structure, that may be the onset of a substorm. There it goes, there's the structure, and now the whole sky lights up. This is what we all want to see, <laughs> the auroral substorm and then a poleward expansion.
Those substorms are fairly short-lived. If you were able to watch the clock there, that was about a 20-minute event. So if you were out watching that southernmost arc, and it was sort of faint, it was uninteresting, and you went back inside for some reason. <laughs> oh, well. So later in the evening, you see these pulsations. I think most people have seen this sort of pulsating be behavior before. Um, a lot of times, this, this sort of aftermath, my thesis advisor, Hans Niels, Nielsen, called the scrambled eggs aurora. Uh, perhaps not as exciting as those discrete arc arcs, but in terms of the energy dissipation within the system, this is actually a very important phase of the aurora. And now we're slowly working our way back into the morning sector. This is 2.30 local time. And I don't believe anything else particularly interesting happens after this. It's just sort of the aftermath of that big substorm event that took place. OK, so hopefully I haven't said anything radically new to this audience. Um, please ask questions if necessary before I make the leap to <coughs> the giant magnetospheres. OK. So, oh, there's a few more things worth seeing. Oh, look at this funny structure. <laughs> it's like a little mushroom. Here's some thin arcs still form, you know. There's still some good stuff going. This is, this probably is worth watching. But again, it's early in the morning, it's 4 a.m. If you made it that late, congratulations. OK, so this schematic illustrates the passion of my research. Uh, this is Jupiter, and there are four Galilean satellites, or moons, which I find absolutely remarkable. It's great that Earth has a moon, but our moon is really boring. <laughs> <laughs> the innermost Galilean satellite is Io. I pronounce it Io because that's the way the Greeks say it. You'll probably hear Io quite frequently, but I've been told by Greek experts this is Io. This is the most volcanically ob active object in the solar system. It is thought that it has a subsurface magma ocean. The whole surface is pockmarked with volcanic fissures and, and structures with, with lava lakes and all sorts of interesting geology and topology associated with its volcanism. Europa, some of you perhaps have heard about Europa. There's a NASA mission that will be launched in a couple of years to go and study, study Europa, its icy surface, and what we think is a subsurface water ocean. Uh, Io does not have water. One of the questions is where did its water go? Did it have water or is it just so volcanically active that all of that water was just as volatiles just escaped and sort of blew off the surface. But this goes from like sulfur dioxide compounds coming from volcanoes and, and magma oceans to icy surfaces with water oceans, just in a short interval. Ganymede and Callisto are also icy. So because this moon is so volcanically active, it becomes a source of gas for the inner magnetosphere of Jupiter. The gas comes out as neutral material, it becomes ionized, and when it becomes ionized, it is then bound to the jo Jovian magnetic field lines, and it forms this red donut or torus of plasma. We call it the eoplasma torus. The yellow is meant to indicate neutral gas. So this plasma torus can be observed from ground-based telescopes. S plus emissions in the visible is easily detected. So this is something we can image from Earth, um, but it is, it is unique to this magnetosphere. At Earth, we don't have a plasma source like this inside of the magnetosphere. The plasma that's in the magnetospheric cavity leaks in from the solar wind. Here we have the exact opposite. We have an internal source of plasma that needs to get out. So part of the reason why Jupiter's magnetosphere is so big is it's being blown up like a balloon, essentially because of this internal source. So the source is about a ton per second of material that's uh, coming off of you. Again, there's a, a clipped image 
false color image of some of these volcanic pock marks that, uh, that you see on the surface of EO. Um, so what I'm going to show you now, because I like numerical simulation, is a numerical simulation of Jupiter's magnetosphere. Uh, this is a recent result. Um, but the primary thing that I want you to see in this simulation, so the moon is buried deep inside. See this, this bright circle? That's where the moon is, EO. And because Jupiter is rapidly rotating, the plasma rapidly rotates with it. So you can see this swirling disk of gas now. So of course, we don't have this at Earth. We don't have a swirling disk of gas. Um, and because of the scale, the 10 hour rotation period, this material is really moving around. And because it's moving around, it actually generates these remarkable waves on the, the boundary of the magnetosphere. This is something that we do have at Earth, but not at the same level of amplitude or violence, uh, however you want to describe it. This is a, a really turbulent um, and sort of deformed interaction with the solar wind. The Earth is much more placid and well-defined. So these wave structures that you see on what we call the magnetopause boundary or the boundary of the magnetosphere are very similar to waves that perhaps you've seen in Earth's atmosphere. These are uh, clouds that are formed, that form these vortical structures. So when you have flow shears in the atmosphere, so winds blowing aloft, uh, then you can produce these surface waves and they can roll up into vortices. So it's essentially the exact same situation that we have at Jupiter. The solar wind is blowing by, the inner magnetosphere is rapidly rotating, and so there are shears between the two regions and you get these, these waves here. These waves, we believe, fundamentally modifies the way that the solar wind interacts with the Jovian magnetosphere. And I won't go into the, the details of, of that interaction, but just suffice it to say that already starting with this rapid rotation internal and internal plasma source, you have a very, very different magnetospheric cavity. Okay, so here is a quick uh, video of Hubble Space Telescope images. And I'll play it back and forth a little bit so that you can start to think about what you what you thought you knew about Earth and what you think you might be seeing here that could be similar to Earth or not. Okay, so let's think. Similarities, there's an oval of emissions, right? Okay, that's similar to Earth. But when I looked at the, uh, the space-based images, it really is just an oval of emissions. The central polar region here was actually dark at Earth. At Jupiter, it's not dark. In fact, some of the most dynamic flashes and flares seem to be occurring in this polar region. So, main oval of emission, is that like Earth? Don't know. This certainly is not like Earth, and then what on Earth is that? Okay, so did I put in the title plural aurora? Aurorae? <laughs> okay, so there are multiple aspects to Jupiter's auroras, aurorae. It has, oh my goodness, I've got a window in front. Okay, so let me play that one more time. Anybody have any idea what this could be? Sitting off to the edge here, it's a bright spot with a wake. A comet. <laughs> it looks like a comet, right? <laughs> so if you follow Jupiter's magnetic field lines from this spot, it takes you right to Eo. Oh. And if you look really close, you might see occasionally some other little spots. I don't know if I can find one for you, but Europa and Ganymede also make similar. Maybe that's one there, I can't tell. Um, that's the EO-induced aurora. There's a fantastically complex electrodynamic interaction that takes place in the plasma that flows past EO. Because it's volcanic, it has an atmosphere. And so the plasma that flows by interacts with that atmosphere, generates currents. Those currents go all the way up the magnetic field, close in Jupiter's atmosphere, and produce these auroral emissions. So this alone, as an auroral physics problem, is absolutely fascinating. And it was, in fact, this aspect of Jupiter's aurora that got me interested in Jupiter to start with. That's a long story. I won't go into it. Oh, wait, here we go. On my screen, I can see it. Oh, sorry, next image, here we go. That's Europa and Ganymede there. Here's Eo, it's Wake, Europa, Ganymede, and something similar. 
So the pleural aurora, we have three different types of aurora at Jupiter. We have the aurora associated with the moons, right? We have the steady main oval of, em of emissions and then this variable polar aurora caused by what? It's a huge problem. Um, and so in my journey to study Jupiter, which started here, I'm currently here. I think I understand this part of it, but I'm absolutely fascinated with this problem right now. And the, and the science community of the, from the magnetospheres of the outer planets are all very much interested in what's causing this because it is completely uh, different from Earth. So just a couple of notes on Jupiter. I'm not going to talk about its atmospheres. atmosphere. Most of you probably know this. This is not a, an oxygen-nitrogen based atmosphere. It's uh, a helium poor molecular hydrogen atmosphere. So actually, what is Jupiter? It's really a gas giant. Um, so there's some gas up here, molecular hydrogen. It becomes metallic hydrogen. Notice there's a big question mark. And then at the center of Jupiter, is there an ice or rock core? Um, to be determined. So clearly the auroral process is probably the same. We, we need electrons to come down and collide with these uh, molecules in the atmosphere to light it up. When I showed you those images of the aurora though, this isn't visible. This is actually emissions in the uh, UV, so ultraviolet. Uh, so that's another distinct dif difference. Uh, when you look at images of Jupiter, when you see these oranges and whites. This is some interesting chemistry. Please don't ask me about this. Like, I, if it wasn't written ammonia, I wouldn't know that. Uh, what else do we have? Ammonium sulfide right here. That's what causes the orange. So these are the, the cloud tops of Jupiter that you're seeing. Uh, but the, the, those are at lower levels. So really, the, the auroral emissions are taking place way, way up off of this thing. And it's due to the impact of electrons and molecular hydrogen. Okay, so there is currently an NASA mission, which is in a polar orbit around Jupiter that's trying to understand the atmosphere, understand the deep interior, and also Jupiter's magnetosphere. It's called Juno. This is a solar-powered spinning spacecraft with eight science instruments. It arrived July 4th, 2016, and it is currently orbiting Jupiter. Um, so to understand the deep interior of Jupiter and its magnetic field, there's an issue. You want to go over the polar region if you want to, want to understand its magnetic field, which is also a, uh, a clue to what's happening in the deep interior. So it has to be a polar orbit, but there's a problem with Jupiter because there's very intense radiation. There are trapped charged particles in these radiation belts. So the only way for a spacecraft to survive and all of its precious electronics is to tuck it in really close to try and duck under these radiation hazards. So this is an illustration of what the Juno orbit looks like. It's absolutely perfect for magnetospheric physics, uh, but it, remember this is a planetary science mission, so it's multifaceted in its, in its science goals. It's got uh, cameras, it's got UV spectrometers, so that can image the aurora. It's got a waves instrument for both radio waves and plasma waves. It's got an infrared spectrometer. Uh, and then it's got some interesting uh, plasma instruments. There's the high energy, low energy particles. There's a magnetometer over here for measuring magnetic fields. There's a microwave radiometer. And that's for really probing into the atmosphere to understand its structure. And then, of course, there's gravity science involved in just orbiting the, the planet itself. So these are images uh, from the Juno UV, UV imaging spectrograph. Um, you might say, well, wait, that doesn't look much better than Hubble. So uh, it's actually a challenge doing this imaging. So the problem is, is Juno comes flying through on closest approach very, very rapidly, and the spacecraft is spinning. So the way the strategy for imaging the aurora is to take a single slit that as the spacecraft rotates, builds an image. So it builds these images in, in little patches and, swat, and uh, swatches of the polar region. And then you have to stitch the whole thing together. So you might be able to see some of the artifacts of the stitching, um, but it's, it's sort of a, a relatively coarse resolution. Nevertheless, from this close range, there's some absolutely magnificent auroral science coming out of this currently. Here's an image from the infrared uh, instrument, uh, again, illustrating some of the very rich 
uh, structure of these auroral emissions. I threw this on because it's been massaged a little bit to highlight certain features from the UV data. This is a paper by a colleague of mine from Liège, Belgium. Um, the first thing that it shows is it shows the Juno orbit mapped onto Jupiter. So you might ask, well, why, why does Juno make these funny loop-de-loops? So remember, the, the orbit is something like this, but the planet's rotating underneath it while it's orbiting. So this is projected into uh, magnetic coordinates of the planet. And so that's, that's sort of the regions that uh, the Juno spacecraft would be sampling on, on a given orbit. So you can see you get very good coverage of the auroral region. This is an absolutely amazing mission for doing auroral physics at Jupiter. And then these false color images, there's uh, some, some uh, spectral tricks that you can do to look at different emission lines and come up with what's called a color ratio. And now you can see these polar emissions are really very, very well illustrated. Here's the main oval of emission out here, but you see that polar region is very, very interesting. So I would love to give you a full hour lecture on why that's interesting and what we think is happening, but <laughs> I'm certain you'd rather ask me some general questions about Jupiter and Earth. But let me just show you this because this was a re recent numerical simulation that was performed for Jupiter using one of the, in my opinion, the state-of-the-art numerical model for studying these giant magnetospheres. It's a, it's a global simulation. So it's, it's massive. It has to be run on a huge supercomputer for many, many hours to get these results out. But this simulation produced something that no other simulation has, or is any other simulation has yet to produce. So what I'm showing you here are magnetic field lines. The red are field lines, which if you start in the northern hemisphere, map all the way to the southern hemisphere, we call those closed field lines. There's a collection of green field lines which start, if you started in the northern hemisphere, they just open out into the interplanetary magnetic field, just becomes part of the solar wind. We call those open field lines. But then there's this bizarre region coming out of, bundle of field lines coming out of the, the polar region, which is closed. You start in the north and they actually close in the south. If we did this for Earth, there would be no such bundle. They'd be all green in the polar region. They'd all open up into the solar wind. So what's interesting now is we, we have this bundle of closed field lines. And certainly from our experience at Earth, aurora generally occur on closed field lines. See? Once the field line becomes open to the solar wind, it's going to be dark, aurorally dark. What's interesting here is these are closed, and yet that whole polar region is lit up with auroral emissions. So to me, that provides compelling evidence that this numerical simulation is probably on the right track. So this is a paper that we're currently working on and hopefully will be published soon. Lots of great science to come from the Juno mission. I'm just giving you the tip of the iceberg. Stay tuned. There's a Juno cam. You can go log on to the Juno websites. You can download the images from the Juno cam and you can do your own graphic art, if you will, uh, using that publicly accessible data. So I encourage you to go and look at the Juno, NASA Juno website and uh, explore Jupiter a, a little bit more. So um, with that, let me just wrap up with this brief tour of Jupiter, its magnetic fields, and the exploration of its interior by the Juno mission. So again, Juno is attempting to pierce those cloud tops to get a, a glimpse into the inner structure of Jupiter. Um, and what the mechanisms are to generate such an unbelievably strong magnetic field. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer questions. How many other people have a similar interest that are your colleagues that you work with? <laughs> so how many other people are crazy like I am? <laughs> So I just got back from a conference called Magnetospheres of the Outer Planets, and there are about 150 of us. <laughs> uh, that's, that's just the number that attended the uh, conference. Uh, that was specific to the magnetosphere. The Juno mission is planetary, so there's the atmospheres community, the deep interior community, so all told, it's, it's many hundreds, if not thousands of scientists. 
worldwide. And do they come from particular countries or nationalities? Right, so um, because Juno is a NASA funded mission, we've got a pretty strong concentration of scientists within the US. Uh, there's a lot of European participation in these missions, however. Um, the, the last Magnetospheres of the Outer Planets meeting was held in Japan. The Japanese actually have their own mission called Hisaki, which is an Earth orbiting telescope that's been looking at Jupiter and the Eoplasmator, so um, they've been very active in this field as well. Uh, and then there's a scattering of scientists from other places all over the world. Uh, on EO, uh, the volcanic gases that uh, contribute to uh, the aurora, uh, do they vary in their output with any regularity? Excellent question. So does, th does EO's uh, volcanic contribution to the magnetosphere vary with time? So typically it's about a ton per second. However, we have evidence of volcanic eruptions and the way that we think that we can identify an event is by an increase in the dust flux throughout the system. So when Galileo was orbiting Jupiter, it had a dust detector and it saw a three order of magnitude increase in the dust count rate in roughly 2000. This was while Galileo was still active. Um, at the same time, Cassini arrived on its way to Saturn and it made measurements of the Eoplasma torus, and what it saw was the torus was very bright, and then it started to fade over two months. So we went and looked at this, because the brightness should be constant. If the source is constant and you're in a quasi-steady state, everything should be uniform, roughly speaking. Brightness should be about the same, but what was causing this decrease? So we discovered that, okay, yeah, there's this increase in the dust counts as measured by Galileo, and then we compared two Galileo images, I believe they're both Galileo, of the surface of Io, and the Tsvashtar volcano in early 2000 looked like whatever, and then after this Cassini event, there was this huge ring around the Tsvashtar volcano. So we inferred that sometime in that interval, that volcano had erupted. So then we had to do some modeling. What does this do to the magnetosphere when a volcano erupts and you get a three order of magnitude increase in dust? Because it's not dust that we're interested in for driving the magnetosphere. We really need atomic sulfur and oxygen. So through our modeling, we inferred that it was about a factor of three increase in the volcanic input into the magnetosphere. And so with the Hisaki mission that the, the Japanese um, uh, have sponsored, had a, they found a similar event where we saw the increase in the brightness, you do the modeling and it's about a factor of two to three increase in the, in the neutral source rate to the magnetosphere. But that happens sort of quasi-periodically, maybe once every two to three years that you get one of these big events. Otherwise, it's pretty steady, about a ton per second. So, yeah, the uh, Aurora Borealis, Aurora Australis are in effect mirror images given the dramatic drift of the magnetic poles and adding comparison with the Jupiter aurora, can you interpret what's happening to the core of the Earth from the aurora by comparing the aurora borealis astralis and Jupiter? That is a great question and I'm not certain I have a quick and simple answer for you. So the question is, is can we, um, in what we know about the magnetic field, the dynamo process that produces our magnetic field, uh, and, what we, and the drift of that dipole and eventual flip of it. Can we use that knowledge combined with whatever knowledge we have from Jupiter to learn more about the generation mechanism of the magnetic field? Is that the, the general gist of it? And can you tell when it's going to flip? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> flipping, flipping is kind of beyond our lifetime scale. <laughs> uh, but it, uh, certainly one thing we do observe is the drift, right? So we see the drift. Um, I'm not a dynamo expert. I assume that Jupiter presumably could feature the same flipping. So the sun does this all the time, the solar cycle. It's flipping um, back and forth every 11 years. At Jupiter, I don't know. So interestingly enough, if you take Earth's magnetic field, it, it points from south to north. <laughs> Jupiter's magnetic field points from north to south, for example. So not all bar magnets are oriented the same way at this point in time. Um, 
Any dynamo experts in the audience that can tell us something about the flipping time scale of the Earth's magnetic field? I can't even answer the question of how long that. Dan, do you know? <laughs> I don't, on the Earth, I've, it's about the order of 100,000 years. 100,000 years. Any coach can get this uh, from looking at the polarization of uh, the samples from the, uh, you know, the rock samples. So residual magnetization in rocks will give you a clue as to the You know, you know the greater continental drift. Oh, okay. okay. And then you can then get some idea of the time scale. Right. So if you, if you can compare similar samples that have drifted? Uh, yeah, you can. Uh, well, the, the space in between. Right. The, the polar, well, the polarity reversion seen in the rock. Right. You know how fast they're moving. So 100,000 years? Uh -huh. that, that, that's the name, that's the number that sticks in my mind. But I have one question I want to ask. Too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then, and then I'll come right back to you. <laughs> yeah, um, have you been able to uh, get close to resolving the, uh, the royal forms that are seen under So, what we have found at Earth, we basically have, roughly speaking, three genres of aurora. We have those thin arcs which are very dynamic. We have broader discrete arcs, and then we have these diffuse emissions, which can be patchy. At Jupiter, by analogy with Earth, Jupiter only has these thin arcs. And the way we know that is the, spec the energy spectrum of the, of the electrons coming in is very similar. So um, those thin arcs we, we characterize by this broadband energy spectrum of electrons. The discrete tend to be more monoenergetic. At Jupiter, every auroral form is broadband. So we, we don't have the resolution to see if they look like thin arcs, but we know that the input is very similar to what is required to generate those thin arcs that we have at Earth. So in some sense, Jupiter may be boring. It only has one type of auroral emission in terms of the characteristic electron energy that comes in. But it's basically alphanic aurora throughout. Even the EOflux tube is alphanic. Sorry, Dan Swift is also prof emeritus, Professor Emeritus, <laughs> auroral physicist, so we'll try not to talk shop during this session. We'll talk more afterwards. Go ahead. Um, with your description of the volcanic activity of EO made me wonder what the size of EO is relative to the size of Earth. So EO's radius is 1,800 kilometers, and Earth is 6,000-ish kilometers. Am I right? <laughs> Ask a space physicist some geology. But anyway, so uh, it, it's, it's smaller, but it's still significant. What's the radius of our moon? Does anybody know? 3,000? Radius. I think it's smaller than 3,000. It's probably more like EO. <laughs> but then EO, in comparison to Jupiter, is that tiny. tiny. Yes. Yeah. That segues that into my question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, if you get these sort of moon generated aurora on Jupiter from EO and Ganymede and Europa and Callisto. Um, but Ganymede, Europa and Callisto don't, aren't volcanically active. They're not contributing to the plasma. How, how come they're Excellent question. So why, why is it that if they don't have volcanoes, why do we get auroral spots from them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The answer is they also have atmospheres. So the thought is that you get... Whereas our moon does not. Right. Well, it depends on who you ask. It does have a... Ten <laughs> I don't consider it as having an atmosphere, but it does have a tenuous atmosphere, very tenuous. So you can actually see the lunar, what do we call it, corona, essentially. Um, these icy surfaces are in, a, in an energetic plasma environment. So energetic particles can stream along the magnetic fields and impact the icy surface, and that produces what's called sputtering. So you can actually knock material off of the surface. And that, that can actually support uh, an atmosphere. So all, what you need for an aurora really is an atmosphere to generate the perturbation to the flow so 
neutral atmospheres are capable of supporting uh, currents in neutral plasma environments like that. So as long as you've got something for the plasma to interact with rather than just you know, a hard surface, um, then you can get substantial currents to flow. You could, you could probably still get currents in some sense. You can induce currents and do other things if you have a conducting subsurface ocean, for example. Uh, but really, it's the atmospheres of these moons that are producing this, in my opinion, these auroral emissions. And if you look at uh, EO, you will see, these are not with your naked eye, obviously, but um, from, from uh, Galileo mission, for example, made some nice images of equatorial aurora on the sides of EO. <laughs> okay, because it has an atmosphere, the magnetic field lines are tangential to the moon, and so electrons streaming along those magnetic field lines can excite emissions in EO's atmosphere. Uh, there, are, there is evidence of auroral emissions on Europa, but Ganymede is special because it has its own magnetic field. Same sort of bar magnet structure. So it actually has auroral ovals, just like Earth. So the, it, it keeps going. I mean, if you keep asking me questions, I can stay here all night. It just keeps going. <laughs> I better step in here and say, come on, one more question. <laughs> Okay, two more. <laughs> <laughs> With the launch of the James Webb uh, Space Telescope and whatever, it keeps on getting close to that, uh, will we be able to st uh, study the aurora of exoplanets and the other stellar systems? Ooh, good question. <laughs> how, how far can we see out there? So, um, Related. I'd be shocked if we could, uh, if we could pull yeah. that. Related, too, is by the color we can tell what gases. That's right. If you can do spectro uh, spectroscopy, you can learn all sorts about the atmospheric and light. That's right. So one of the greatest, well, the simplest way to detect aurora perhaps is in radio emission. So the way that we, this was back in the 50s, Boulder, Colorado, somebody was looking, listening for radio signals and discovered that there was this periodic signal coming from Jupiter. So you can't do that nowadays. We have too much radio noise. <laughs> um, but it turned out that this was a radio signature coming from the EO-Jupiter interaction. It's associated with that EO spot, okay? So it's like, wow, there's something happening between the moon and the planet. This was before Voyager went. So radio emissions like that, if there was something similar to an EO-Jupiter as an exoplanet, maybe you'd see it in the radio. Uh, James Webb, I, I'd be shocked if you could <laughs> zoom in enough to actually detect uh, you know, an individual planet like that but I'm expecting Webb will do a fantastic job on Jupiter and Saturn. Hubble did a great job. This will probably be even better. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and maybe a more, a more cosmic question. Um, if stars are emitting, uh, that could be when it's just gone blank on, uh, the solar winds, or whatever you call them on other mm -hmm. stars, or the sun, um, are they all far enough space in the cosmos that we don't get Jupiter, Earth, and Aquarius, you guys looking for stuff, get interference from other solar winds? I, I mean, that's the vision of the universe. Which right. is, so, so let's just say each star is blowing out a, a solar wind, stellar wind. So if we, if we look at um, our own heliosphere, so a magnetosphere is a cavity in space that that magnetic field sort of carves out in the interplanetary medium. Similarly, the sun and its magnetic field with the solar wind, carves out a cavity into your stellar space called the heliosphere. So there is a heliopause, there's a boundary to that. We've got Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, which we think have actually perhaps gone through that boundary and are now in interstellar space. Um, so that's just yet another cavity. So what is beyond the, the heliosphere? So at some point, this supersonic flow eventually becomes subsonic. Um, you get this termination shock. And then you presumably pass through a boundary, there's some pressure balanced surface, and now you're in interstellar space, which is primarily neutral gas. It's very tenuous, rarefied gas. It also is moving or streaming past the heliosphere. So you can think of the heliosphere as also having maybe a nose to it and a tail, just like a magnetosphere. Um, where did the interstellar gas come from? Well, maybe it came from another star, but it, it became neutral again. If, if you leave gas alone long enough, an electron and an ion can recombine. Uh, 
And usually you need some driving force to get them to reionize. You need bright light or you need collisions, you need something, you need heat. Uh, but generally gases tend to, when they're cool enough, recombine. So it may be the, some of that neutral gas in the interstellar wind had its origin from another star. Let's give a round of applause for somebody who actually made this stuff. It's my pleasure.